The subject of tonight's talk is one of the great, towering, legendary figures of Jewish history. His name was Rabbi Eliyahu, the son of Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Kramer, 1720 to 1797, and he is known to all as the Gon of Vilna, or the Vilna Gon, or the Gra, which is an acronym for the Goen Rabbi Eliyahu, uh, or he's simply called the Gon. If you just say the Gon, the, ge- the genius, you're referring to Rabbi Elio Kramer of Vilna in the 18th century. And he has a really unique storyline. He never in his lifetime published anything, even though he wrote voluminously. He never held any rabbinic office. He never headed a yeshiva. He never had any uh, official position. For the majority of his life, he remained cloistered in a small room with the windows shut, studying Torah nonstop. And despite that, despite, despite being isolated, he was universally recognized as the undisputed leader of the nation, and his impact towered above all others in his generation. And indeed, I would say his impact continues to be an immense source of influence that's molding the nation until this day. Now, the word Gaon means genius, and we'll see from his story that he's really an otherworldly genius. He had a phenomenally organized mind. He had a photographic memory, and this was not just like a savant that you hear a prodigy. Literally, he had everything he ever saw was before him. Clearly, and he became a a Torah scholar of unmatched proportions. He was an expert in every arena of Torah. Everything was like he had just studied it and was right there before him. He was also renowned for his piety. Indeed, in his lifetime, he wasn't known as the Gon of Vilna. He was called Rabbi Elio HaChassid, Rabbi Elijah the Pious. Now, his story, this is important to stress from the beginning, when you learn it and you read about it, it's, it's so legendary, it doesn't really seem to be very practical. You know, he's a genius of geniuses. He's a prodigy of epic proportions, a savant's savant. And I think that there is still a benefit for us to hear about his life, to know just that such a persona existed. And even if it's far beyond anything we comprehend, I think there's still a benefit uh, to hear about it just to kind of go through his youth to see how much of a different world he's from. He wrote a commentary on Shulchan Aruch, and in, his, in the introduction written, it's, pop, it's published posthumously, but in the introduction written, his sons, they give an insight into his early childhood development. So at the age of three, he already knew all of Chumash by heart. Very soon afterwards, he had mastered all of Tanakh. At the age of five, he was already heavily steeped in Talmud. At six and a half, and this they write in the introduction, he gave his first public lecture, his discourse in front of the whole city. And this is the city of Vilna, which was the Jerusalem of Lithuania, a city of renowned Torah scholars, and he just blew them all away. And they write that only until six, the age of six could he have any teachers. By the time he was six, he was a greater scholar than his teachers, and he was studying on his own. He, at eight, began studying Kabbalah. And most kids today, when they're eight, you know, they're barely toilet trained, right? <laughs> uh, he, he's doing Kabbalah. And he became a, an expert very, very quickly. At the age of 10, he already knew Sefer Yitzira and, and Eitz Chaim. These are fundamental works of Kabbalah. And he became a, 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 an unbelievable expert in Torah, but also in mathematics, in astronomy, in science, in music, and all these diverse fields as well. And all of it he actually gleaned from Torah. He was famous to have said again and again, all wisdom is inherent in Torah. And he would also use it only for Torah. And that's going to be uh, one of the hallmarks of his life is an obsession with Torah and totally devaluing and de-emphasizing anything else in his life. In the same introduction, his sons write that we cannot apply to him any yardstick, any, any metric that works for us. It doesn't work for him. He's beyond our comprehension. He's from a different world. At the age of 13, he made a decision 
to devote himself completely to Torah. When we say completely, it means entirely, completely to Torah and nothing else. And he began, and he determined, he made a decision to not benefit even a little bit from any worldly, material, bodily pleasures. For example, this is his son's uh, testify, that he would never look outside of his immediate zone. And this is something that we find in the, in the Talmud. It talks about the great giants in the Talmud. They would never look outside of their four cubits, outside of eight feet. They were never, their heads were always down, always thinking about Torah, and they weren't involved in the world. They weren't looking around. His daily food intake consisted of two olives worths of bread dunked into water, and that he had twice. That was his food for the day. And he would strive not even to taste it, just to swallow it and just to get the nutrition and to move on. And his son's right that he would, uh, the family, there was some means there. He was supported by the community and by a family fund that he had. But he, this is a quote from his sons, he lowered his shoulders, vayet shichmo, to bear the burden of hunger and the lack of sleep, more about his sleep in a second, in order to outweigh his Yetzirah. He was determined to not have any, to not live in this world. He was living in a different world. And his students said about him that when you were in his presence, you felt like you were with an angel. This is not someone who's earthly, who has any physicality or materialism to him. His sleeping patterns. He slept two hours a day, broken down into four increments of 30 minutes. Three at night and once during the day. And he would sleep for 30 minutes and he would arise like a lion to continue studying Torah. And if he would start drowsing off in the middle of the night, he would dunk his feet into ice cold water to keep, keep himself awake and to study Torah. He is purported to have said that the objective of sleep is to be able to acquire Torah knowledge that's beyond the intellectual capacity of a person. And his sons reported that even when he was sleeping, he was always murmuring words of Torah in his sleep. And this is, again, akin to the teachers in the Talmud. The Talmud has a few episodes in it where it talks about great sages that they would, when they would go to sleep, all their students would crowd around them to hear a lecture. What lecture is he going to say in his sleep? People who are so steeped and immersed in Torah study that that's what they do when they sleep. They dream about Torah and even were talking words of Torah in their sleep on a very high level. And he was obsessed, like many giants, with utilizing every single second of the day, when he was awake and when he was even sleeping. And he, for example, famously said that if someone is totally dedicated to doing mitzvos and totally committed to studying Torah, well, such a person can find a loophole around a very vexing problem. And the problem is, well, as a human, you need to eat, even if it's very meager, and you need to sleep, and even if it's very truncated. Well, how could you forfeit studying Torah for doing anything else? So he said that, well, if all you do is study Torah and do mitzvos, and then out of sheer exhaustion, you go to sleep, so the only reason why you're going to sleep is because you need to, and it's only to enable you to study more Torah. Well, that itself is a mitzvah. And he would maintain a ledger, a journal. In it, he would write how many seconds of his life, of his day, would he not be doing mitzvahs or studying Torah. And he would keep a ledger of it. And the most that ever was in a given year was three hours. If you take all the time he wasted, so to speak, in a given year, the maximum was, was three hours. And he would bitterly cry on Yom Kippur, to try to atone and repent for wasting time. Again, 
these, this is beyond our comprehension, but this is someone that we had in our nation uh, a few hundred years ago. Now, though he was endowed with off-the-charts intellectual capabilities, he didn't rest on his laurels. He didn't take it easy. His diligence, his dedication, his determination, his devotion to Torah study are unmatched. So he's this amazing marriage of capabilities beyond description and commitment uh, as well. He would study Torah by candlelight during the day because if he opened up the windows— There might be noises or distractions that would stop him for a second. And in order to avoid that, close the windows, seal himself off from the rest of the world, and study Torah by candlelight, even by day. he would sit in his room, donning talus and tefillin, always wore talus and tefillin, totally immersed in Torah study with superhuman diligence. He would review all of Talmud, for example, which most people never get to finish. And even those that are committed to a regiment of Talmud every day, they finish every seven and a half years, he would finish it every month. And he was also committed to hard work. The story goes, just like Ramchal and Rabbi Yosef Cairo, before him, the Goan of Vilna had a visitation from a Magid who was coming to teach him Torah, and he rejected it. I don't want any freebies. Everything I get, I want to earn myself. And there's a Talmud in the book of Megillah that says, Yagati velo matsasi al tamen. If someone tells you, I toiled, I worked really hard, but I did not find, I wasn't successful in Torah. al Taman, don't believe him. Lo yagati umatsasi, al Taman. I did not toil, but I still found, I still was successful in Torah. Don't believe that either. Yagati umatsasi Taman. Only if someone says, I toiled and I was successful, then believe them. Everything else is a farce. And what the Golan would say from this, first of all, you notice that there's a little bit of a disconnect. The word yagati, which means I toiled, it means hard work. But the word matsasi means I found, you don't, you don't plan on finding something. You don't, can't work hard to find something. Finding something happens randomly. What he said is that the way Torah study works, it's you have to invest all your efforts in it, but the actual result, that's a gift. That's something you find. But you'll only find what you find if you work hard to achieve it. And he was determined to do that. When he was 18, he married a woman by the name of Chana from Kedan. And he continued to totally immerse himself in Torah. He had a small hut in a forest several kilometers outside of Vilna. And he would go there to study for months on end without any distractions, and periodically his wife would come and drop off some food. Uh, They had seven children, three sons and four daughters. One of the daughters died young, but the three sons became giants of Torah in their own right, and the three daughters married giants of Torah as well. But it's safe to say that the children were raised by their mother. Uh, He was supported by a fund set up by his great-grandfather, And he received additionally a stipend from the community of Vilna, even though he was not the official rabbi of the community of Vilna. There was a separate rabbi, and think about that. Everyone knows that one of the greatest Torah leaders of the past millennium is in your neighborhood, but you have to be the official quote-unquote rabbi in that city. It wasn't an easy job. Uh, And the city recognized what they had, and therefore they, uh, they granted him a stipend for his, just to study uh, just study unmolested, uninterrupted. I want to share with you two stories that uh, show his relationship that he had with his children, which I think is very shocking, uh, but also it does demonstrate his commitment to Torah study, above all, including family. So his sons relate, how much was he committed 
to not spend time and company with his children, with his sons and his daughters. All he, all his, the only relationship was Yiras Hashem, fear of God, mitzvos, studying Torah. He never in his life asked his sons or his daughters, hey, how are things going? Or, hey, um, are you making a living? How is it going with the kids? Never. The only time he, the only thing he talked about with his children was, did you study? How are your studies going? Are you learning? Are you growing? Nothing else mattered to him. And in fact, he writes, this is surprising again to us, and again, I'm not suggesting that anyone partake this behavior. In fact, I think it's probably a bad idea for us. When his children would come for, vi- to, for, for a visit, so they'd come for a long trip, and they want to sit down and drink some tea and just schmooze, he will tell them, wait a minute, don't you have a regiment of Torah study every day? You were on the train. How are you going to make up that time? Again, a total obsession with Torah. Now, but what you see, and I think this is important to mention, you see from the way his children write about him that they absolutely loved and adored him and revered him. And it's obvious that he merited that treatment from them. They knew that this was an angel, so to speak, living amongst them, and all he wanted to do and all he was mandated to do was to study Torah, and they felt the love nonetheless. But listen to this story. And this is two of the brother, two of the sons of the Goan of Vilna writing about their third brother, Shlomo Zalman. He was five or six years old, and his father loved him so much because he recognized his greatness or his potential. And one time he got sick. And he was still sick. He was very sick. And this is a time, of course, when sick kids don't necessarily become healthy kids. They Sometimes they die. That's, of course, the time that they're living in. But the father, the Gona Vilna, had a regiment. And that meant that he was time, time to leave. When it was time to leave, to go to his hut in the forest, to study Torah by himself, he left. And he gets up and he goes there. And he's there for a month. And then... He went to the bathhouse, and the halacha is, the law is, that you're not allowed to think about Torah in a bathhouse. So he's in the bathhouse, and he starts thinking about other things besides for Torah, and he thinks about his family, and he remembers, I have a son, Shlomo Zalman, that was sick a month ago. Let me go home and see how he's doing. And he went home to, th- to see how he was doing. What this shows us is that this is a different personality. This is someone that I think it's important for us to appreciate such a greatness, such a uh, such an exemplar can exist in our midst or did exist in our midst and just marvel at that, even if it's not necessarily so relevant uh, to us. Now, remember, he was called Rabbi Eliyahu HaChassid, Rabbi Elijah the Pious. His kindness that he had with other people was superlative. Like if he would see someone that was in need, he would give him everything. He would take stuff, uh, household items off the shelf and give them, give them away. Uh, obviously, I'm sure to the consternation of his family. Once, for example, uh, the Gabai, the local administrator in charge of giving the stipend from the city to the Goan of Vilna, he figured, well, what happens if I take it? The goan is never going to embarrass me publicly by calling me out. So he started pocketing the, the checks. And he's pocketing them for months and months and months and years. Three years, he pocketed the money assigned for the goan of Vilna. And he doesn't say anything. Uh, there was once a story where his family actually ran out of money. They had nothing to feed their kids. And it's dinner time. And apparently the Goan told his sons, go visit your friend's house and uh, hopefully you'll be fed there. Uh, Obviously, this is a different reality. And there's a famous story about his piety. In this era, uh, there was a custom to employ a professional rebuker, a mochiach. Uh, This is someone who would, you would hire someone to come and tell you things that you can improve. So one, one year, it was the day before Yom Kippur, 
And the Dubna Magid, another great personality of this time, uh, he gets called in by the going of Vilna. I need you to give me some, give me some rebuke. Give me some castigation. Well, what could he possibly tell the going of Vilna? So all the students are told to leave the room. And he goes there. He's there for a few minutes. And he emerges and the Gon is in bitter tears. So they asked him, what did you tell the Gon? What did you tell Rabbi Elijah that made him so sad? And he said, well, I, I told him that it's very easy to be the Gon of Vilna when you're sitting in your room by yourself, not living in the rest of the world, not being in contact with other people, being isolated, being secluded. How great would you be if you were forced, like everyone else, to go pedal for a living and to go interact with other people? You're by yourself, and it's really easy. That was the rebuke, and indeed, the going to Vilna took it uh, very, very sincerely and very dearly to his heart. Uh, there was another, another story, interesting story, that shows his commitment and his piety. We know that we're encouraged to do mitzvos because it's what God wants and not for any benefit or kickback that we might get. Even a kickback in Olam Abba, a kickback in the next world, the world of reward and punishment. So there was a tradition in the city of Vilna that all the wealthy people of the city, they would bid, they would vie for the rights to buy a beautiful, pristine esrog a beautiful, pristine citron, which is the fruit used on the holiday for the going to Vilna. And one year, there was short supply, and they couldn't find an esrog that was befitting of him. Finally, they found someone at a great distance away, and he said, yeah, I have a beautiful esrog, and I'll give it to you on one condition. The condition is that the Gon of Vilna promises that whatever benefit he garners in the world to come for this mitzvah, he passes it to me. So they were like horrified by this. What, what are they going to do? So, well, they go back to the Gon of Vilna and tell him what happened. He starts rejoicing. Finally, I could do a mitzvah lishma. I could do a mitzvah for its intended purpose to know that I'm not getting anything all above. I'm just doing a mitzvah because God tells me to do it. And he was indeed delighted. In his mid-twenties, he went on an exile, one of several exiles that he would undertake in his life. He never shared his reasons why he did them, uh, but there's rampant speculation, several reasons. Uh, Number one, perhaps, because he wanted to endure the pain of exile, to go from town to town, to not be recognized, and to gain repentance from that. Others suggest, perhaps, that he would go to meet and study with other Torah scholars, and he would go, and no one would know. Remember, there's no pictures. Everyone knows that there's this going to Vilna, but there's no pictures anywhere of him. So you go to the town, you just sit in the back, and you could study and meet other people and talk to the people without having them uh, to give you any uh, judgment uh, beforehand. And he would do this, and he would go for months, even years, on these exiles. Uh, One of the theories as to why he did that was to visit the major libraries of Europe and pore over ancient manuscripts of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, the Midrashim, the Sidurim, and to find ancient texts and manuscripts and to amend and fix the texts that we have with against the text of ancient versions of those uh, books. In, I think, 1753, the British Museum was opened in London, and apparently, and I have not sourced this, but I've heard that they found a document, like a visitor's log, to the British Museum, and it said, Rabbi Elijah Vilna came here. And we know one of the roles that he played in Jewish learning was to fix all the errors that went in, um, that crept in to the books. Remember, printers weren't generally the greatest Torah scholars around. And they would see, for example, a very, very common tactic in in Hebrew books. You take words and you make them into um, 
uh, Rashi Tevos. You take uh, one word and you make a little acronym out of it. And sometimes th- those letter combinations can mean multiple things. And therefore, there were mistakes all over, uh, and there was no there was no one who had the capacity uh, to be able to actually fix that. Now, the Gona Vilna, with a phenomenal memory, knows it all by heart. He doesn't need to take books with him to compare them. It's all in his head. And he could sit and amend thousands of texts and have documentary evidence that there's ancient manuscripts that support his hypothesis that there's a mistake, a word here, a word. If you open up any page of Talmud, You'll see in every side of the side of almost every page, there's something called Hagros Hagra, the emendations of the Gra, the Gona Vilna, where he would go from place to place, find ancient manuscripts, and fix the text of the Talmud. Very often, a Talmud doesn't make any sense because there was a mistake that had crept in, and he would fix that. And he wouldn't take he would take this very seriously. In fact, he would fast before he committed himself to make any uh, emendation uh, to the Talmud. He returned to Vilna eventually, he resumed his learning, but he also expanded his public role by accepting a small cadre of students to study with him. He never opened the yeshiva, where he had multitudes of, stu- of students, but he would have a handful of students at all times that would be there with him and be part of his inner circle. In his 40s, he decided to go to Israel. And there's a famous letter called the Igeris Hagra, the letter of the Gra, uh, where he writes to his family. And it begins, he says, I want to tell you, don't be upset. Don't be sad. Don't worry. I'm going on a trip. I'm going to Israel. And many people, they travel on business trips. And they go without their families for many years just to make money. And they suffer, and they do everything just for money. I'm going to Israel, and I'm going to the Holy Land. Everyone's trying to see it, and I'm gonna have the help of God with me. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about me at all. And it's a whole long letter. Eventually, that trip was aborted. No one knows why. His sons asked him, "Why did you cancel your trip?" And he told them cryptically uh, that. I don't have permission from heaven to go. What's interesting, a postscript to that story is that his students, beginning in 1808, which is 11 years after he died, several hundred of them made Aliyah to Israel and established a community, initially in northern Israel, finally in Jerusalem. They were known as the Purushim, those that separated. And actually what they effectively did, they bolstered the Jewish community. And indeed, since the 1840s in Jerusalem, uh, Jews have been a majority of the population. And that's why in Israel, the minhagim, the customs of the Gorav, the Gona Vilna, uh, are followed uh, because they were the ones who pitched their tent there and they established what the custom is going to be. Later in life, the Gona became involved in national issues. For example, we spoke about last time about the Ramchal, Uh, Ramchal was dogged by accusations of being a Sabbatean, and the Gon came to defend him. And famously, the Gon committed the Messiah Sisharm, the path of the just to memory. He said, There's no extra words. He said, If if Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzata from Ramchal was still alive, I travel by foot to meet him and to study by him. The Gon also defended Rabbi Yonason Eibeshetz, one of the swirling controversies of our nation of the 18th century was when two of the greatest ra- uh, rabbis, greatest Torah scholars of their age, uh, who were living actually around the corner from each other, one of them accused the other of being a Sabbatean. And the whole Jewish world erupted. And the Gon came out of his seclusion and defended Rabbi Yonason Eibeshitz. He was also imprisoned several times by the Russian and Polish overlords. Uh, once there was a controversy where the rabbi of Vilna was fired because he was appointing relatives to public positions. And the Gohan actually sided against the rabbi, uh, but the issue kind of uh, became more heated and escalated. Eventually, the secular courts got involved and they imprisoned him. And eventually, they freed him uh, due to lack of evidence. The second time he was imprisoned uh, was when there was a Jewish boy 
uh, the son of one of the prominent communal leaders, he baptized himself and joined a local monastery, and a plan was hatched to kidnap him and to try to convince him to rescind, and that's what they did. And then they started arresting everyone that they thought was participating, including the going to Vilna. Eventually, they released him from that episode as well. There's another amazing story, and uh, we'll introduce it with the Talmud. The Talmud says to us in the book of Brachos, it quotes a verse in Deuteronomy, Uro kol lecha All the nations of the land will see that the name of God is called upon you, and they will be fearful of you. The Talmud says, well, what does it mean that they'll see that, that, that the name of God is upon you? That means they'll see your tefillin. And we know the Gon was always wearing tefillin. And the story goes that there was um, a non-Jew that wanted to convert. And the Gon assisted him in conversion. And they came to try to arrest him. And he removed his talus. And he exposed his tefillin. And they got all tense and steer, and they just left him. Now, of course, we could show our tefillin to everyone and probably won't make much, much of an impact on them. But someone as holy as the going to Vilna, he actually had that the nations of the land were fearful of him. Another public matter that he partook in was the controversy with the nascent Hasidic movement. The opposition to the Hasidic movement was very fierce, and it was spearheaded in large part by the Gon of Vilna in the second part of the 18th century. And the claims against them uh, was that they took certain liberties with regards to halacha, most prominently that they didn't really matter about the times of prayers. We know that there's specific times for prayers, and the Hasidic ideology of getting your heart involved in mitzvos, and that meant or that resulted in people saying, well, I'm not quite in the mood, I'm not in the zone to pray, and therefore let me wait, even if it means waiting until afternoon or evening. And the Gohan wrote in one of his letters, well, following this line of thought, it may happen that you'll, you won't blow the shofar until Pesach because you're not in the mode, in the zone of blowing shofar. Or you won't eat matzah until Sukkot. And we know there's very rigid halachas. You've got to live within those, that, that framework. Uh, there was another claim that they studied Kabbalah extensively. Uh, they tampered with the Siddur. They changed the Nusuch, the text of the Siddur. Uh, and they started to have this splintering where they would start their own shuls. And of course, that always raises a controversy. Uh, lastly, the Gon was very upset. Uh, the Gon was very worried that they used a new kind of knife for shechita. We know to have a kosher animal, you have to slaughter it. And there's many details about what kind of knife you have to use and what kind of process you have to use. They made the knife sharper and thinner, and the Gohan felt that that would make the animal not kosher. So he was very involved with this. Uh, There were decrees of excommunication. In one letter, they were labeled as not chasidim, which means pious one, but chashudim, which means suspected ones. And uh, it wasn't, this is not a very great episode of Jewish history. Uh, there were recriminations. The Hasidim responded with their own counter bans and counter excommunications. There were book burnings. Both sides informed on each other to the local government. There was even occasional violence. The first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, he tried repeatedly to reconcile by meeting the Gon, and he was refused an audience. He famously said that if the Gon had met me, he would know that all the He would be assuaged from all his fears about Hasidism. Regardless, the Tzemach Tzedek, who's the third Lubavitch Rebbe, he said that the Gon actually saved the Hasidic movement by forcing them uh, to respond to his claims and to pivot towards halacha, or towards the strict letter of the law, 
and to find a way to infuse the meaning and the energy that they brought to Judaism within uh, the realm of, of normative halachic uh, Jewry. In the end, of course, the sides reconciled, and indeed very soon after the Gon's death, actually the tables were turned. The Hasidism was no longer this minority, this upstart. They became the majority of the Jews, and they really indeed saved the Jews because there's many, there were many dangers um, that were sweeping the Jewish world, namely the Haskalah movement, which is a movement uh, of abandoning Torah in mass. Now, um, the Gon is also pivotal uh, to the establishment of the, the modern yeshiva. In his closest student, Rabbi Chaim Velazhener, a titan in his own right, he actually was commissioned by the Gon to write the Nefesh HaChaim, which is actually a response to the Tanya. And he came to the Gon with a proposition. He said, we're facing a crisis that our nation has never faced. And that is that there is an intellectual alternative to Torah for our people. There's emancipation, there's enlightenment, Jews are being welcomed into the universities, they're being granted citizenship all over Europe, and many Jews find the appeal and the allure of these new opportunities to be irresistible. And therefore, we have to respond in kind by offering a more compelling intellectual product in the form of a yeshiva. And he came to the Gon with this idea, he was very enthusiastic, and the Gon said, no. Two years later, he came and he was more subdued this time and once again asked to open up a modern yeshiva. And this time, the Gon told him, yes. When asked to explain why he changed his position, we said, well, the first time you came and you're all excited and you're all passionate about it, I could tell there was an element of it that wasn't pure, that wasn't dedicated for the sake of heaven. Now, we see that you, you, you're coming without the pizzazz and then it's more likely to be successful. And indeed, the yeshiva that resulted, the famous Velazhin yeshiva, that was the uh, bulwark of the 19th century, uh, became what's known the mother of yeshivas. Before th- beforehand, people would, of course, study Torah, but they'd do it in the shul with the local rabbi of the community. Those that were great geniuses would be sent maybe to a bigger rabbi in a bigger community and would study with them, but it was nothing formalized. And these students who would be sent out to different places, they would rotate their meals by local families. It's called the Essenteg. They go on Monday to the Goldbergs and on Tuesday to the Goldsteins and et cetera, et cetera, right? And of course, that was a demeaning and degrading practice to go sit with some strange family and eat breakfast, lunch, and supper with them. Uh, in Velazhin, they did away with that. They made it a formalized, modern institution of Torah and Torah alone that was indeed instrumental in slowing the tide of the Haskalah. We said earlier that the Gon published nothing in his lifetime, even though he wrote voluminously. One of his students, Rabbi Yo of Shklov, wrote that the Gon wrote 70 books, including 30 of them on Kabbalah, though 20 of them are missing. We have 50 of them, and we're missing 20. Famously, he said that he's so proud of his works and his writings on Kabbalah, he would not be ashamed to share his chidushim, to share his insight with no, none other than Rabbi Shema Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar. After his death, these books were published by his family, and indeed for 60 years after his death, uh, and even till today, they're still publishing uh, not original works of the Gon, but compilations on various topics. He wrote so extensively. So some of his books that are really fascinating is, for example, his commentary on Mishle, commentary on Proverbs. It's a cornucopia of beautiful, amazing, insightful insights on that magnificent book. For example, in chapter... 16, he writes, Every man 
Every person has his own path to spiritual greatness because people don't think the same way and their faces are different, which is a quote on the Talmud, and people's inclinations are different. And when the prophets were extant, people would go to the prophets to ask the prophet to tell them, which path should I take to achieve what is at the core of my soul? Nice, amazing, beautiful idea. His most significant contribution to the Jewish library is his commentary on Shulchan Aruch, a vast commentary in all four sessions of the Shulchan Aruch. And he stresses to show how every halacha, every word of the Shulchan Aruch can be traced back uh, to the Talmud. But there's also a, a style that became unique to him, a style of his ideas. Uh, he was uh, um, he had mastery over literally every letter, every word of the Torah, and he would craft uh, patterns and insights that no one else would see. So for example, and there's thousands of them, in the Torah, the, the word sukkah, like a sukkah that you sit in on sukkahs, it's spelled two ways. It's spelled with a samach, a kaf, and a hay. And in that instance, the vowel is not in the form of a letter. And alternatively, it's spelled samach vav kaf hay. So why is it spelled differently? Says the going of Vilna. What's the gematria of these two? Without the vav, it's 85. With the vav, it's 91. If you study all of the book, a Talmud of sukkah, and it talks about all the various different kinds of sukkahs, you'll find that 85 of them, there's 85 varieties of a kosher sukkah, and there's 91 varieties of a non-kosher sukkah. And that's why the Torah, the way it spells it, it's hinting at the fact that there's this internal uh, consistency between the Talmud and the Torah that the words used in the Torah for... Sukkahs hint at the fact that there's 85 of them that are kosher, 91 of them that are not kosher. Kind of a, an idea that none of us would come up with because, <laughs> you know, we, we just come to the sukkah, right? We hope it's kosher. Uh, another example here. The Talmud in the book of Sota tells us, page 5, that a Torah scholar has to have an eighth of an eighth of pride. Kind of a really strange idea, an eighth of an eighth of pride. Where does that come from? It doesn't say. It says the going of Vilna, if you look at the eighth section of the Torah, in the eighth verse, it's Jacob telling God, I am small from all the goodness that you did for me. Well, Jacob is telling God, this is when he's about to meet his brother who's coming at him with 400 warriors in Parshas Vayishlach. He tells God, you did so much good for me, I already exhausted my goodness. So what you notice from that is that what Jacob does have is a modicum of pride. He is acknowledging that he does have some goodness, it's just already, it's small, it's already been used. Because it's the eighth verse of the eighth, eighth parsha, it means it's what's an eighth of an eighth, 164th. And there's, like we said, there's literally thousands of them. Uh, the go on, on one verse, we know that he literally said thousands of explanations uh, on one verse. There's no area of Torah that he didn't write on. And what's unique about his writings is that they're not very useful friendly for us. Uh, he wrote them in a very terse, very sparing style. It's not easy to study. It was essentially written for scholars and not for laymen. Uh, my father asked my grandfather, um, when is Mashiach coming? It's a good question, right? Everyone wants to know the answer to that. And he tells them, learn all the writings of the Gon, of Vilna, everything, and then you'll see it. Well, how will I know when I see it? It's there, it's written. And that's it. He doesn't explain exactly where to look. So good luck finding that. Uh, the Gon was... Um, accustomed to saying that everything that ever happened that ever will happen is in the Torah. Well, what does that mean? 
so that's a question. How, how big of a scope does that go? You know, does that mean that everything is the will of God and the Torah is the will of God? Or does it mean that every single solitary event that happens in all the universe is in the Torah? But regardless, someone asked the Goan of Vilna, okay, well, where are you in the Torah? Where does it talk about you? So he told him, go to the end of the Parsha Kiseitze in chapter 28 or so of Deuteronomy. There's a verse that says, Even shleim of it said that yihi alecha. You should have a perfect, complete, and righteous stone. What this means if you're selling vegetables and you're selling a pound of them, well, how do you measure a pound? You have a stone that weighs a pound and you put the vegetables on the other side and when, it, when it's balanced, you know you have a pound. But of course, if you shave a little bit off the edge of the stone, no one could tell and that's not a perfect stone and therefore you could fleece your customers have a perfect stone. Well, the word even shlema can be read even shlomo or Eliyahu ben shlomo, Eliyahu the son of shlomo. And in fact, the Goan wrote a book called even shlema. And I'm just going to throw this out. Uh, there was this theory, and I mentioned it once, that the 5,845 verses of the Torah correspond to 5,845 years since Adam. If you do the math, the verse of Evan Shleim of it said that Yihilcha, the verse that the Gon said about himself is the verse that refers to him, that appears in the year that would that corresponds to 1797, actually 1798, because he died a little bit after Rosh Hashanah, but that's the year that the Gon died. Uh, so some have theorized that what the Gon is actually saying is that the map of what's going to happen in the world actually follows the pattern of one verse in the Torah equaling one year since Adam. There's many, many, many other books. Just one of them that's really important, Maise Rav, which is a book not written by him, by one of his students. It's a list of thousands and thousands of practices that the Gon would have and customs. Uh, he wanted to write a synopsis of the Shulchan Aruch. And again, he was told, he told his children, in the heavens, they don't want me to do that. The Gon died on the intermediate days of Sukkot in 1797. Famously, on his deathbed, he was clutching his tzitzis, crying for a few kopecks, for a few pennies. You could buy a mitzvah, you could buy tzitzis that once you're dead, you no longer have access to doing this mitzvah. It's amazing, this world, a world of accomplishment, that you could do so much with such ease, just a few pennies, you buy yourself a tzitzis, and you wear them the whole day, and you have mitzvahs every second, and now I'm going to die, and that's what he is disappointed about. Uh, he was buried in Vilna, in the cemetery, and there's a little bit of a postscript to his burial, the Soviet Union, after World War II, decided to turn that whole location into a soccer field. So they were going to plow up all the graves and build a soccer field. And the Jews protested and were granted to move seven graves. Among those that they chose to exhume and reinter was the Gona Vilna. And there is testimony of the people, the Hevra Kaddish that, partake, that partook in this. When they dug up the Goan of Vilna, of, or 150 years after he was buried, they found his body had not decomposed a bit. His hair on his head was intact. And even his beard was still wet from the mikvah that they placed upon him. And that's based upon, um, we know that only someone who is wicked is going to be consumed by worms and maggots when they are buried. Someone as holy as the Goan of Vilna was totally untouched. His legacy could be captured perhaps by some of his contemporaries who labeled him as a once-in-a-millennium scholar. He was sent to heaven, from, from heaven, so to speak, to illuminate the world 
with Torah. His primary student uh, said about him, when you were with him, you felt like you're with an angel. Uh, others have posited that uh, we know Jewish history and Jewish philosophy looks at the world as being continually devolving. And the Gon of Vilna was sent, the Vilna Gon was sent to stem the decline of the generations. And that's why he had a practice uh, that uh, was very uncommon, that he would argue with Rishonim, he would argue with rabbis of the medieval time. Almost unheard of to, for someone to do that, but it, it is said that he was equal to them in stature, and therefore he could argue with them. Uh, he is an iconic, towering, legendary Torah scholar. He is the intellectual father of Lithuanian Jewry, uh, and he, more than anything else, ensured that Torah and Torah greatness and Torah commitment and Torah study and Torah scholarship is at the center of Jewish life.